Hello, and welcome to the very first Hemingway Society uh, webinar series, House Guest Hemingway. I'm Suzanne Delgizzo. I'm the editor of the Hemingway Review, and I am also the chair of the Hemingway Society Media Committee. The Media Committee put this idea forward when we realized that we would have to postpone our Wyoming and Montana conference this year due to COVID-19. Although this webinar series in no way can take the place of our amazing conference, uh, we are hoping it will provide a wonderful way for our membership to connect in this most strange of years. I'm going to take a minute to acclimate you to the webinar. You are in a Zoom webinar, and if you uh, are an attendee, you are in what's called view only and listen only mode. That means that you can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. Your microphones are muted and your webcams are off, and they will remain that way throughout the entirety of the presentation. To interact with us, you should use the Q&A function. To access that function, if you take your mouse cursor and you scroll it across the bottom of the black Zoom screen, you should see an icon appear that says Q&A with two dialogue, two dialogue bubbles. That when you click on that bubble or that icon, you will get a window and you can ask us questions at any point during the presentation. We will share questions, especially questions that are asked more than once with Susan Beagle at the end of the presentation or toward the end of the presentation. And just for full disclosure, this webinar is being recorded. So with all of those details about orientation taken care of, I'd like to introduce the Hemingway Foundation and Society President and Professor of English at Appalachian State University, Carl Eby. Thanks so much, Suzanne. And, and thanks to everyone for joining us and, and welcome to this new venture for the Hemingway Foundation and Society. Obviously, I'd hope we'd be meeting for our usual biennial uh, conference this summer, uh, which we'd planned for, you know, in Wyoming and Montana, which would have been fabulous. Uh, but having to postpone the conference until next year, uh, our board's media committee came up with the terrific idea of this series of webinars. And I want to thank the members of the committee, Suzanne Del Gizzo, Cecil Ponder, um, Kirk Kernett, Alex Vernon, Thomas Bevilacqua, and Michael Von Cannon for the considerable labor that went into planning these webinars. It's a, actually a lot of work. Um, these really promise to be a lot of fun and a really rewarding way to celebrate, yeah, albeit a couple of days early, uh, Hemingway's birthday. Um, Next, I want to thank in advance the speakers we're going to enjoy hearing. Today, uh, Susan Beagle, right, she'll get things kicked off for us with an all too timely talk on the medical education of Ernest Hemingway. Tomorrow, thanks to Sandy Spanier, Miriam Mandel, and Katie Warzak, uh, we'll have a presentation from the Hemingway Letters Project on the fifth and latest volume of the projected 17 volume edition of Hemingway's Complete Letters being published by Cambridge University Press. I know in the past week, you know, or maybe week or two, many of you have received your copies uh, of the book that you've ordered, um, fresh off the press, and I hope you're really loving it. Uh, it's a thing of beauty and a monumental work of scholarship. And I want to thank everybody involved in the Letters Project uh, for their ongoing outstanding work. Sunday, uh, we'll get to enjoy a sneak preview of the new documentary, Hemingway, directed by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, uh, written by Jeffrey C. Ward, and produced by Sarah Botstein, Lynn Novick, and Ken Burns. It's slated for broadcast on PBS in the spring of 2021. For Hemingway fans around the world, I want to thank the entire documentary team for their many years of work on this project. And I want to especially thank director and producer Lynn Novick and producer Sarah Bodstein for joining us uh, this Sunday for the discussion that will accompany that preview. While I'm mentioning upcoming events, uh, I also want to encourage members of the Hemingway Foundation and Society to stick around for our second webinar on Sunday. Uh, that's going to be our annual membership meeting. 
you do have to be a member to join this meeting. So if you haven't become a member of the society yet, please be sure to visit the Hemingway Society website and join up. Among the various things we'll be discussing will be two exciting site proposals for our 2022 conference, one for Genoa, Italy, and one for the Basque Coast in Spain. All right, um, now for today's presentation, it's my privilege to introduce our good friend, Dr. Susan Beagle. Susan holds a PhD in English from Yale University and is no stranger to Hemingway studies, having served as editor of the Hemingway Review for 22 years. I'm sorry, I hope you're laughing as hard as I laughed when I first read that sentence. No stranger to Hemingway studies. <laughs> Susan wrote that in a very modest bio paragraph she gave me. But I've got to butt in here and say that as a scholar of Hemingway's manuscripts, as a scholar of Hemingway in medicine, as a sensitive eco-critic who's written beautifully on Hemingway in the sea, Susan's contributions to the field have been enormous. And her, in her role as editor of the Hemingway Review for 22 years, she did more than anyone I know uh, to mentor an entire generation of Hemingway scholars. And that's saying something because we're fortunate to be a field with a great many generous scholars. Like so many of us enjoying today's webinar, I am deeply grateful for everything she taught me. Now, back to Susan's more modest bio paragraph. Uh, she's published four books and more than 50 scholarly articles on aspects of American literature and history. Susan comes from a multi-generational medical family with roots stretching back to the late 19th century. Hence, her, is, her interest in Hemingway's medical education. The child of two doctors, she grew up in a house that included her father's medical office and her mother's pathology lab. Her most recent and relevant teaching experience has been several years facilitating literature and medicine groups for staff at Central Maine Medical Center uh, and St. Mary's Regional Medical Center on behalf of the Maine Humanities Council. Susan's most recently completed project is a podcast for the JFK Library on Hemingway in the 1918 influenza pandemic. Pretty timely. Uh, I encourage you to look for that uh, podcast at the John F. Kennedy Library website. The title of Susan's talk today is How Do You Like Being an Intern? The Medical Education of Ernest Hemingway. Please join me in imagining the thunderous applause that would normally greet Dr. <laughs> Susan Beagle. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's a great honor to be here this afternoon, and um, thank you so much for inviting me. I think like everyone, I, I wish we were in, in Wyoming enjoying all the wonderful things that our, our conference people had planned for us. Um, so much work to be greeted by the year 2020. And uh, I know I was looking forward to seeing old friends and making some new friends and, and hearing what everybody else had to say. But we, we will be back. Um, we are Hemingway people. We are connoisseurs of beautiful places. We are travelers, we are congregators, and it may take a couple of years. Who knows what the future really holds for us, but when I get depressed, I, I think of all the places Hemingway went after 1918, right? Which, so we'll be okay. Um, I guess I have to, I have this 14 pound cat in my lap, which was not supposed to happen, um, <laughs> he refuses to be excluded. He is my Boise, so he, he's a Hemingway touch. Um, if it seems like I'm behaving strangely, that's why. And um, with that, let me just give you a little introduction to what I'm going to talk about and we'll get going. Um, our webinar committee asked me if I would speak about something pandemic adjacent. <laughs> and I, I think we're probably all a little worn out on pandemics at this point. So I decided that I would do something on Hemingway's medical education. Um, this lecture is, is from scratch. I wanted, I wanted 
to do something special for you. And as I got going, I realized that, wow, that could be a book, <laughs> Hemingway's Medical Education. And I had to shorten it down. So we're going to look at Hemingway's childhood, which is when he was really being actively mentored by his father. I'm going to give you a, a, a little introduction, and then we will go to Oak Park and to Michigan. And uh, finally, we will exit by way of, of Indian camp, which I think is his most important medical story. Okay, so checking on the whereabouts of the cat. <laughs> Let's get going. Ernest Hemingway is a writer with a profoundly medical sensibility. The most cursory examination of his work reveals a medical situation in almost everything he wrote. And I'm gonna catalog for you a few examples, which I think could be categories the next time we're together to play Hemingway Jeopardy. Hemingway's medical specialty was trauma. We have war trauma, shattered skulls, disembowelments, spinal cord injuries from high impact explosives. We have sports injuries, boxing trauma, black eyes, cauliflower ears, concussions, chronic traumatic brain injury, as we know now, gorings in the bull ring, not just plain gorings, but abdomen, chest, through and through, accidental traumas, blunt force injuries from automobile accidents, accidental ax wounds, stabbings, accidental gunshot wounds, poisoning, jellyfish stings. But it's not just about the wound. There are infectious diseases, amoebic dysentery, cholera, typhoid, tuberculosis, pneumonia, influenza, both pandemic and plain vanilla, not to mention venereal diseases, gonorrhea and syphilis, and other medical aspects of human sexuality, abortion, contraception, sterilization, the traumas of rape and genitourinary wounds. He does obstetrics, his father's specialty, breech birth, cesarean section, postpartum hemorrhage, he mentions procedures and operations, physical thera therapy, enema, contraceptive douching, gas and air anesthesia, amputation, tubal ligation, trepanning. He writes unflinchingly, unflinchingly about blood, afterbirth, mucus, feces, urine, and the stench of gangrene, and sometimes we really wish he wouldn't. He was profoundly interested in the problem of pain both physical and mental. And so he also wrote about psychological disorders, alcoholism, heroin addiction, depression, insomnia, post-traumatic stress, self-mutilation, gender dysphoria, and suicidality. He even wrote about the vicarious trauma of medical personnel and family members experiencing the pain of others, from stretcher bearers to expectant fathers. My business, is with the wounded, says the surgeon in A Natural History of the Dead. And I think that could easily be Hemingway's own statement of vocation. He was a medical humanist. The central problem of his work is humanity's struggle to find a way to exist in a vulnerable and finally mortal body. His is a world where the act of sexual intercourse can cause sterility or madness, where the acts of being born and giving birth can sometimes be fatal, where life is a gauntlet of mischance, human violence, and infectious disease, where neglected scratch can kill you, and where old age, if you reach it, is filled with physical indignity and decline. If you are very lucky, like Colonel Cantwell and across the river and into the trees, at best your heart attack will give you a moment of grace to lie down in the back seat of the car so that your death doesn't inconvenience anyone. All right, so if you weren't convinced that he has a medical sensibility, I hope that helps. The subject of my talk today is how a medical education that began in childhood shaped Ernest Hemingway as a writer and a man. When Ernest was nine years old, he signed his name in a guest book at a family dinner party. Ernest Hemingway, MD. His sister Marcelin writes about how pleased their father was to see this. Dr. Ed Hemingway had begun grooming his son for medicine almost from the time Ernest could walk, teaching him relevant skills and allowing him to help in the office, see practice, and eventually even to see surgery. Sort of common in this time today. Medicine often um, taught as a kind of apprenticeship. 
So what I'd like to do is dial back the time machine to the first decade of Hemingway's life. And because the essence of Zoom seems to be visiting people in their home offices, I felt it might be instructive to visit a space that helped shape young Ernest, his father's medical office in the family's Kenilworth Avenue house, which was built in 1906. Today, we're used to seeing our doctors in sterile, impersonal examining rooms in corporatized medical office buildings. But in Dr. Hemingway's time, most physicians were in private practice and their home offices reflected both their personal interests and certain professional norms. And because the Kenilworth home was designed by Hemingway's mother, Grace Hall Hemingway, presumably in consultation with her doctor husband, we can consider that as medical spaces are especially personal. They didn't have to adapt a house that wasn't quite right for them. So first of all, the family's library doubled as a waiting room. Hemingway's older sister, Marcelin, tells us that the room was paneled with oak bookcases full of natural history books illustrated with colored plates of birds, animals, and flowers, literary classics including Dickens, Stevenson, and Shakespeare, and a curated collection of current novels. Curated means no Jack London. Doctors receive deep discounts on magazine subscriptions for their waiting rooms. This is one of the perks of, of being a doctor. So the home library was rich in periodicals. Marcelin recalled The Youth's Companion, St. Nicholas, National Geographic, Scribner's Outlook, Ladies Home Journal, Harper's, World's Work, and the Atlantic Monthly. And there was a unique personal touch. Dr. Hemingway practiced taxidermy as a hobby and displayed stuffed owls, squirrels, chipmunks, and a small raccoon on top of the bookcases. The library waiting room projects the era's ideal of what a doctor should be. And that's an ideal created by physician and author Sir William Osler, O-S-L-E-R. Osler helped found the Johns Hopkins Medical School, and he created a template for American education that's still largely in use today. His ideas dominated the education of Dr. Hemingway's cohort, not only through Osler's 1892 textbook, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, but especially through his extensive philosophical writings on how physicians should live and conduct themselves. And those are some ideas I'll be referring to today. Osler was a medical humanist. He believed that the practice of medicine is an art based on science. And to perfect their minds and better understand the humanity of both patient and provider, physicians needed to augment their study of science with the study of literature. Osler put it this way, when tired of anatomy, refresh your minds with Oliver Wendell Holmes. After a worrying subject in physiology, turn to the great idealists, to Shelley or to Keats for consolation. When chemistry distresses your soul, seek peace in the great pacifier, Shakespeare. The library then projects an image of Dr. Hemingway as a man of letters as well as science, a learned physician. But the decision to place the waiting room in a shared family space was unusual, even in this era of home offices. Physicians at this time were bound by their code of ethics to turn no patient away, regardless of medical co condition or ability to pay. That's no longer true today, which would be an interesting subject, but never mind. But it was then. So a family doctor with a specialty in obstetrics Ed Hemingway possessed an almost missionary sense of vocation. In fact, his brother, Dr. Willoughby Hemingway, was a medical missionary. His waiting room saw men, women, and children from every walk of life with a liberal dash of pregnant women and squalling infants. And all of these, the Hemingway family chose to receive in the book-filled heart of their home. And perhaps the library wasn't such an unusual place for a waiting room after all. In Osler's view, patients were poetry, so where better to file them? Nothing will sustain you more potently, he advised young doctors, than the power to recognize the true poetry of life, the poetry of the commonplace, 
of the ordinary man, of the plain, toil-worn woman, with their loves and their joys, their sorrows and their griefs. Ernest Hemingway, who as an author would celebrate the extraordinary courage of ordinary people, may have begun his involvement with suffering humanity as a child, peering through the waiting room door at the patients in the library. So, okay, the doctor's running late, we're in the waiting room, and we find ourselves staring at stuffed owls, squirrels, chipmunks, and a small raccoon. I'm gonna ask you to bear with me here. Maybe this is an obsession of mine, but I think it's relevant. Although amateur taxidermy can seem grotesque, disturbing, or even comical to us today, the library's collection of taxidermed animals reflects a period belief in the study of natural history as a gateway to the study of medicine. Osler recommended that such study begin in boyhood. And we have long appreciated how Dr. Hemingway led an Agassiz Association chapter for local school, ch school children devoted to the observation and study of natural objects. And we know he allowed to, Ernest to join at age four. What we haven't appreciated is that taxidermy was part of the curriculum. The handbook of the St. Nicholas Agassiz Association recommends that children be equipped with double-barreled breech-loading shotguns for collecting specimens and begin their study with birds. The handbook describes how to skin birds, pick out their eyes, remove their brains from their skulls, make incisions at correct locations, detach skin from flesh and flesh from bone, preserve skins with arsenic powder or arsenic soap, and finally dry the skins. Wings and leg bones were wired and realistic bodies created with cotton batting and more wiring. The prepared skins were then sewn on and birds appropriately posed. The art of taxidermy, the handbook tells us, requires some knowledge of comparative anatomy, as well as careful study of the habits of each animal, its peculiar manner of sitting, standing, holding the head, etc. So I think taxidermy's application to basic medical training is obvious. It requires a level of comfort with death and dissection, surgical skills with a scalpel and needle, and a knowledge of anatomy that includes understanding how the postures of the living reflect what lies beneath the skin. And so young Ernest studied taxidermy under his father's tutelage. Children in the Agassiz Association prepared specimens for their own natural history museum. Ernest was the assistant curator. A letter from father to son tells us that Ernest worked on a kingfisher and a weasel. Mammals were harder than birds. A boyhood photo shows him pretending to feed a nut to a taxiderm squirrel that may be his own work, or otherwise it's his father's. And Marceline tells us that the great blue heron that Ernest shot illegally as a teen was intended to be a taxidermy exhibit, and it would have been a showstopper. So <clears throat> obviously, Dr. Hemingway did not display his stuffed chipmunk to advertise his prowess as a hunter. Marceline felt it was meant to under entertain the patients, but the chipmunk also advertised his prowess as a surgeon. The doctor's surgical repertoire included delicate operations on the faces of infants to repair birth defects, as well as construction of noses and chins and the correction of protruding ears. A hobby of taxidermy, especially one involving small animals, allowed Dr. Hemingway to practice and retain skills that were relevant to plastic surgery on newborns, even as it would prepare his son for the study of comparative anatomy and human cadaver work in medical school. Ernest, on the other hand, kids never learn what, what you expect them to learn, came to understand taxidermy as an art and absorbed its aesthetic credo. Dr. Hemingway introduced Ernest to the work of Max master taxidermist Carl Akeley at Chicago's Field Museum, which was known as the Sistine Chapel of Taxidermy in an era when stunning dioramas of wild animals in their habitats reigned supreme in the museum world. And practiced as an art, taxidermy has a credo, a Latin motto, in fact, ars celere artem, art to conceal art. A great taxidermist, like a great plastic surgeon, should imitate nature so closely and skillfully that his own role becomes invisible. 
The Essence of Taxidermy, described by an American Museum of Natural History artist, is dedication to scientific accuracy and humility before the beauty of nature. And this strikes me as one essence of Hemingway's writing as well. In a high school report called A Visit to the Field Museum, a teenage Hemingway made a connection between the arts of taxidermy and writing. He discusses his admiration of these various, of, of a glitch, okay. He discusses his admiration of some of the ha habitat exhibits that he saw and writes that, that the taxidermist who mounted these various groups were artists and showed it by their attention to the little thing. It is almost as good as seeing the animals themselves alive to see them in their native haunts in attitudes true to life. It is in fact better, it is better in fact than the impressions habitat groups of, okay, this is all screwed up, I'm so sorry. Um, that is because of a nasty thing. Um, that happens when I try to do block maneuvers. So I'm just going to tell you, he's writing about a specific diorama of Carl Akeley's called The Four Seasons. It's a diorama of a uh, white-tailed deer. And he's going on about how taxidermists are artists. They show it by their attention to the little things. He loves that it's almost as good as seeing the animals alive to look at this fabulous taxidermy and that it's actually even, even better than seeing them alive because you really can take your time and observe. But then suddenly there's a shift in what Ernest is writing as he considers his own encounters with deer living and dead. Same sentence where he's writing about how taxidermists make these animals better, almost better than life. And he writes, well, in life, my experiences with deer, for instance, have been a flash of brown, a glimpse of a white flag, a quick throwing of the rifle to the shoulder, a pressure of the trigger, a blinding flash and a crashing report, the headlong panting run to the game and the wild joy of the kill or the consciousness of a miss. So the goal of taxidermy, Ernest understands, is to make the dead seem alive. But stuffed animals frozen in static poses do not seem alive, he realizes nor are museum conditions how we experience them in the wild. And he seizes this moment to demonstrate to his teacher with a series of swift impressions that he can do a better job of making something true to life with a pen than a scalpel. And if you doubt this makes a difference, I would refer you to Fathers and Sons, where Nick Adams looks at and considers the job that the undertaker did on his father's face and then makes exactly the same shift to that beautiful, one of the most beautiful passages in Hemingway's writing, his father came back to him. When he gives us a series of impressions through the four seasons, by the way, which truly restores his, his father to life. And I think some of that began with the taxidermy. All right, now you're probably relieved we're gonna get out of the waiting room and head into Dr. Hemingway's inner sanctum his combined examining and consulting room. Ernest, Marceline tells us, was often allowed to help in the office, although she doesn't exactly say how. Here we find more bookcases, this time housing the doctor's medical library and the latest medical journals in a glass cabinet full of medical instruments. So now, to, from tomorrow's webinar, we're gonna hear from scholars who like to read other people's mail. Um, I'm a scholar who likes to look in other people's medical cabinets. <laughs> So, the most dangerous feature of any home medical office is its locked cabinet full of drugs, and Hemingway's dad, of course, had one of those too. During this period, the only non-addictive painkiller available for, to physicians was a new miracle drug. There was just one non-addictive painkiller, aspirin. So, the medicine cabinet of this period almost certainly included cocaine, which was the era's only local anesthetic, as well as morphine, tincture of opium, which we call laudanum, and possibly even heroin. Dr. Hemingway could legally dispense any of these without regulation or control, and indeed, they were freely available in over-the-counter patent medicines at this time. One notorious example was Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup for teething babies, which contained morphine and alcohol, neither listed on the label, and stopped many babies from crying permanently. 
So, in part, to protect his patients from what Osler calls strange medicines, Dr. Hemingway actually created his own remedies for them, including a popular pineapple cough syrup. And I really wish we knew what was in it, but unfortunately we don't. Okay, so this is the childhood home of the future alcoholic who would ask in The Gambler, The Nun, and The Radio, why should the people be operated on without an anesthetic? Why are not all the opiums of the people good? Ernest began writing about both alcoholic and drug-seeking patients as a teenager, and he may have known that doctors themselves are especially vulnerable to addiction. He would cover substance abuse and mature work from a pursuit race to a movable feast. Certainly, Ed warned him about what was in that cabinet. Osler writes, man has an inborn craving for medicine. Heroic dosing has given his tissues a thirst for drugs. It is really one of the most serious difficulties with which we have to contend. But the real centerpiece of the office was a black leather chair that could be extended to become a couch. Here patients could sit to recount their histories or recline for examination. And believe it or not, Sir William Osler was the first to insist that the patient should be the focal point of medical education. Who knew? <laughs> and that students receive instruction at the patient's bedside. He's, Osler said if he was remembered for just one thing, he wanted to be remembered for that. Prior to Osler, training took place solely in lecture halls, laboratories, and operating theaters. But in an era that had very few diagnostic tests and no internal imaging, except rudimentary and dangerous x-rays, maybe you remember the one in Gamble to None in the radio that, that causes interference with everybody's radio all over town when they turn it on. Physicians who were molded by Osler's ideas learned the importance of taking a thorough history from patients and observing them minutely for any sign that might hold a clue to an injury or disease process at work within. In other words, they had to look very carefully at the outside of their patients to figure out what was going on. Not true anymore, they don't have to look at all, they just order a test. Listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis, Osler wrote. So in accompanying his father or being instructed by him, Young Ernest learned the art of the medical interview, which was excellent training for a writer. So many people have commented on what a good listener Hemingway was. Well, he's actually examining now, <laughs> is what's going on. Now, <clears throat> near the big chair, where the patients presented themselves for examination and told their stories, we find Dr. Hemingway's large roll top desk, which is stuffed with papers and crowned by the doctor's typewriter. And here, for confidentiality's sake, the doctor would type up his own notes about his patients, recording their histories and the details of their treatment and progress, keeping notes focused to physician's thinking and preserved information vital to future care. But some doctors, and Ed Hemingway was one, hoped for a little something more, collection of a case history sufficiently compelling to be publishable. Think of Dr. Adams in Indian Camp and his exulting. That's one for the medical journal, George, and I'll, we academics, of course, identify with that. A publishable idea. Dr. Hemingway did not publish a lot, but he did publish, and particularly interesting for our purposes is his 1908 article for the Chicago Medical Recorder, Sudden Death That May Come to a Recently Delivered Mother. The article reviews the deaths of four obstetric patients under his care, and it shows him to be an unflinchingly honest and self-critical physician. So let's just listen to one of these stories. I couldn't pick, so I just picked the shortest one. I was called to deliver a multipara, that's a woman who's had several children before, who had been under the care of a midwife for 36 hours. The sack of waters had broken 24 hours before I was called, and an arm had extended from the vagina some 15 hours. They had waited for everything to get through. But alas, nature had had no help. I had delivered the same woman of a transverse child exactly two years before, and this time the midwife thought she could manage. I reduced the prolapse arm and secured the feet and delivered but the mother died within an hour, 
of exhaustion and cardiac paralysis. She had an old rheumatic heart. This is a short story in 109 words. It records the tragic suffering and death of an older mother who leaves behind several children and a newborn infant. It describes the culpability of an overconfident midwife with a mistaken belief in letting nature take its course. It's a story told in a clinical voice, except for the little spike of condemnation in Alas, Nature Had Had No Help. And it's a story told without emotional coloration by a narrator who is also a participant. Could we call it Hemingway-esque? I think we could. The clatter of the doctor's typewriter provided the soundtrack of Hemingway's childhood. Young Ernest observed his father collecting and recording stories daily, modeling his own future habit as a writer. And the boy almost certainly read Sudden Death at some point. Another case presented there involves a first time mother who died from hemorrhage, her end reminiscent of Catherine Barclay's. But whether or not Ernest read his father's work, 10 years later, we find the doctor's son, his projected path to college and medical school short-circuited by World War I, reporting for the Kansas City Star from a hospital emergency room. Like Dr. Hemingway in Sudden Death, he presents a series of case histories in a single article called At the End of the Ambulance Run. And here's one. Again, couldn't pick one for a short one. The night ambulance attendants lifted the unconscious man to the operating table. His hands were calloused and he was unkempt and ragged, a victim of a street brawl near the city market. No one knew who he was, but a receipt bearing the name of George Anderson for $10 paid on a home out in a little Nebraska town served to identify him. The surgeon opened the swollen eyelids. The eyes were turned to the left. A fracture on the left side of the skull, he said to the attendants who stood about the table. Well, George, you're not going to finish paying for that home of yours. George merely lifted a hand as though groping for something. Attendants hurriedly caught him to keep him from rolling from the table. But he scratched his face in a tired, resigned way that seemed almost ridiculous and placed his hand again at his side. With an attention to detail that Osler would have admired, this vignette first offers clues to the unconscious patient's life, the calloused hands of a working man, the unkempt and ragged appearance of someone down on his luck. These would be details important to a doctor. It presents both the known signs of fatal brain injury and records this particular patient's unique gestures. The narrative voice is clinical, the patient's death documented without emotion. And yet the receipt for the mortgage payment gives the man a name, fictional I hope, suggests perhaps a wife or a family and asks for empathy. And that's not bad for an 18 year old. I think he learned that from his dad. As we prepare to leave the doctor's office, a final look around shows us a small attached laboratory with a microscope for examining blood and sputum samples. Doctors did a lot of their own lab work then. Ernest began using the microscope at age four, beginning with geological specimens, learning how a magnified gaze could reveal unsuspected worlds. And the laboratory also housed Dr. Hemingway's human specimens, a diseased appendix and a tiny fetus pickled in jars, and the fully articulated skeleton of a woman used to teach patients how bones were connected. He called the skeleton Susie Bonaparte, and his children were allowed to take it to science class when they reached eighth grade. According to Marcelin, the skeleton also haunted their nightmares. This appearance of human specimens, the appendix, the fetus, the female skeleton, marks the approach of an emotional hurdle that separates physicians from ordinary mortals. And that's a willingness to violate our deeply held taboo against slicing into a human body, dead or alive. We, we all have this. Osler had made the study of anatomy the foundation of a medical school education, both through the dissection of human cadavers and also post-mortem autopsies to determine cause of death. He thought medical students should do an autopsy a day. <laughs> Taxidermy had been preparation for that. Surgery, however, 
also a requirement of physician training, would demand engagement with living bodies, human bodies. And again, Dr. Hemingway tried to prepare his son um, with something age appropriate. And for this, we must leave the Oak Park office. There is a strong connection between surgery and blood sport. Almost as soon as Ernest could walk, his father took him fishing, sharing a sport that requires the angler to place live bait on a hook, threading it, for instance, under the chin, down through the thorax, and out through the abdomen of a grasshopper, as in Big Two-Hearted River. And who can forget the salamander, the impaled salamander clutching the hook with its tiny feet in, um, what is that? Is that in, oh wait, now, now I lay me. Um, okay, so that's Big Two-Hearted River. Later, the angler has to take, remove the hook from the mouth of a wildly distressed living fish and either return the fish to the water without further injury or kill it with a sharp blow to the head. Gutting and cleaning follow a kill along with careful observation of the fish's anatomy. Again, Big Two-Hearted, they were fine trout. Nick cleaned them, slitting them from the vent to the tip of the jaw. All the insides and the gills and the tongue came out in one piece. They were both males, long gray-white strips of milt, smooth and clean. We don't know how Dr. Hemingway taught his young son these skills. He apparently did it well because Ernest had a lifelong love of fishing, and as did his own sons. But we do know how Ernest taught them to a child who remembered her lesson very well, Honoria Murphy, Gerald and Sarah's daughter who was a young teen when she caught a trout while fishing with Hemingway in Wyoming. He said he would show me how to clean the trout, and I started to wave my arms wildly and shriek as I was not about to touch a dead fish, let alone cut it up and clean it. Now, daughter, said Ernest, let's grow calm while I explain to you the beauty of this creature from the water. He then proceeded with an enchanting explanation of the design and function of the fish. First of all, they have a rough skin protection called scales, and we are going to scrape them off. Now, notice how the fish is shaped. It is narrow at the tail, so it can glide through the water. Can you see how the inside of its gills look like pink coral? Look at the silver shine of its underbelly and the fine feathery lines of its fins. Don't they look like lace? Ernest placed his knife in my hand and guided it as I slit open the stomach. Then he explained the arrangement of the trout's internal organs. As we cleaned the trout together, I no longer felt squeamish, and I was glad I had performed well for Ernest. So here we no notice how Hemingway, perhaps like his father before him, calls on a child to be calm, focuses her on the beauty and functionality of the fish's anatomy, and finally places a knife in her hand and guides it as she eviscerates an animal alive just seconds before. Maybe trading a little bit on the desire of the child to please. So next comes an introduction to surgery on human beings. When Ernest was in high school, Marcelin tells us, their father allowed him to watch an operation at Oak Park Hospital, where Dr. Hemingway was on staff as head of obstetrics. Dressed in a white gown, she writes, Ernie was permitted, permitted to stand at the top rear of the operating theater. Her brother was interested, she says, but he sat down when he felt faint. Given Dr. Hemingway's specialty, the surgery was undoubtedly a cesarean section, usually performed as an emergency. For Ernest, the operation was an introduction not to the miracle of birth or the wonders of surgery, but to vicarious trauma a then unrecognized mental health problem for physicians. Years later, the memory seems to surface unbidden in a farewell to arms as the medical staff wheel Catherine away for surgery. I looked through the door and saw the small bright amphitheater of the operating room, Frederick tells us. There were benches behind a rail that looked down on the white table and the lights. He overhears nursing students hurrying to the entrance of the gallery as young Ernest might have done in Oak Park where the hospital was attached to a nursing school. It's a cesarean, one said. They're going to do a cesarean. The other one laughed. We're just in time. Aren't we lucky? Another nurse tries to get Frederick to take a seat in the gallery, but he declines. I'm staying outside, he says. <laughs> 
We don't know the outcome for the Oak Park mother or baby. I hope they made it. But if the mother hemorrhaged as Catherine hemorrhages, death was likely. There was no cross-typing and matching of blood for transfusion until 1914. We do know, according to Marcelin, that her brother never returned to the Oak Park Operating Theater. And we can speculate about how the experience contributed to Hemingway's anxiety when his son Patrick was delivered by emergency cesarean section while the author was at work on a farewell to arms. Like Frederick, Ernest chose not to observe. Writing to Waldo Pierce about his son's birth, he said, it's nothing for a guy to watch when his affections are involved. Hemingway had known that for a long time. So now it's time to leave Oak Park with its brightly, with its brightly lit operating room and its well-appointed office and see actual practice up in Michigan, where the Hemingway family summered at their cottage on Walloon Lake. Dr. Hemingway held a medical license in Michigan as well as Illinois, and during summers at the lake served pro bono as physician to a community of Ojibwa bark peelers at a nearby lumbering camp. While it was socially and professionally difficult for the doctor to take Ernest along on house calls or inject him into office visits with Oak Park suburbanites, in Michigan, Dr. Hemingway's Ojibwe charity patients had little choice but to tolerate Ernest's presence. At their camp, in their shanties, Ernest could observe and even assist in treating patients. As it was summer and he was out of school, he was free to accompany his father often. Ernest's younger brother Lester writes, father was the only doctor on the lake then. The Indians were the poor of the area, owning no land and seldom holding jobs for long since all the big timber had been logged out. They had regular emergencies, stabbings, broken bones, serious infections. Ernest often went with father on these calls. He learned a lot about emergency medicine under primitive conditions. His younger sister, Sonny, remembers, our dad was ministering to the Indians that lived in the lumber camp near us. Mostly it was fire water trouble, juniper berry trouble, pneumonia trouble, etc. Marceline remembered two specific cases, one when Ernest got to watch his father clean a gunshot wound, and another that I think made an especially deep impression on him. Let's see if it sounds familiar in any way. Ernie helped while my father cleaned out a bad cut suffered by a young boy. In this case, Ernie held the boy while daddy probed into the wound for the splinters of wood which had been driven deep into the flesh. And that sounds very much to me like an ax wound to the foot. A fragment of a manuscript Hemingway wrote in high school, no worse than a bad cold, shows that he was learning about the extra vulnerability of the poor to infectious disease and the relationship of cultural displacement to alcoholism and suicidality, which were both epidemic in the camp. In seeing practice with his father, he was finding adult subject matter and developing a complicated empathy. This brings us to Indian camp, the mature fruit of Hemingway's medical education. The unforgettable and horrifying centerpiece of the story is a cesarean section performed by Dr. Adams with a jackknife and without anesthetic on a struggling, screaming Ojibwe woman forcibly held down by Uncle George and three Indian men. The doctor proceeds without a word to his patient and finished stitches her up with fishing line nine foot tapered gut leaders. Everyone interviewed who knew the family in Michigan agrees that Dr. Hemingway never did any such thing. Not a word of it is true, Ernest's actual Uncle George told Mrs. Wesley Dilworth. Probably the cesarean Ernest saw at Oak Park Hospital underlies Indian camp. But there's no operating theater in an Ojibwe shanty, and in the short story, a very young Nick participates in the surgery by holding a basin. After the trauma of seeing his father gut a woman like a fish, and can I just, as a doctor's daughter, say there's a very big difference between seeing a surgery and seeing your father perform a surgery? It, it, <laughs> this daddy um, is doing this. Okay. In the short story, a very young Nick participates in the surgery by holding a basin. After the trauma of seeing his father got a woman like a fish, Nick looks away so as not to see Dr. Adams rummaging in her uterus for the afterbirth. 
It continues looking away when the placenta lands in the basin, and he refuses his father's invitation to watch him sew up the invitation. Nick's curiosity had been gone for a very long time, the narrator tells us. <laughs> I've always loved that line. This may reflect Hemingway's own first experience of watching his father operate. The moments when Ernest felt faint, had to sit down, decided not to return. In Indian camp, a temporarily elated Dr. Adams asks his son, how do you like being an intern, Nick? And Nick responds, all right, <laughs> but nothing about this is all right. <laughs> Indian camp is about many things, and one of them is the sheer cruelty of biological nature. Hence the fishing imagery of jackknife and gut later. Pain, as any mother can tell you, and as Dr. Adams points out in an age-appropriate explanation, is an integral part of natural childbirth. Listen to me, he says to Nick. What she is going through is called being in labor. The baby wants to be born, and she wants it to be born. All her muscles are trying to get the baby born. That is what is happening when she screams. What is more, risk is an integral part of natural childbirth. You see, Nick, babies are supposed to be born head first, but sometimes they're not. When they're not, they make a lot of trouble for everybody. Maybe I'll have to operate on this lady. At this time, around nine women died for every 1,000 live births. An author that Dr. Hemingway greatly admired, Chicago obstetrician Joseph DeLee, who's considered the father of modern obstetrics, put the problem of death in childbirth this way. So frequent are these bad effects that I have often wondered if nature did not deliberately intend that women should be used up in the process of reproduction in a manner analogous to that of the salmon, which dies after spawning. Perhaps all the evils soon to be mentioned are in fact natural to labor and therefore normal in the same way as the death of the mother salmon is natural and normal. Anybody want to sign up for this practice? <laughs> Um, thus did Dooley, who Ed Hemingway called one of our best authors, conclude that the natural birthing process is pathological. That's his word. The natural birthing process is path pathological, and therefore it's ripe for medical interventions such as high forceps deliveries and cesareans. And while it's unlikely that Ernest read Dooley's work at any age, but who knows, he was curious, the books were there, Indian camp's use of the jackknife and gut leader imagery creates a similar analogy between laboring woman and um, expendable fish and demonstrates Hemingway's appreciation for a basic premise of period obstetrics that echoes throughout his mature work. We are always trapped biologically. And I, I don't think that's anywhere truer than in labor. Nick, however, is immediately concerned with the patient's pain. And here, Hemingway's, young Hemingway's experience in forcibly restraining the Ojibwe boy with a bad cut may be foundational. Interested the author was in the subject position of Uncle George in his childhood <laughs> and not somewhere else. Nick is emotionally overwhelmed by the laboring woman's audible agony. Despite his father's explanation that her pain is natural, Nick asks, oh, daddy, can't you give her something to make her stop screaming? And Dr. Adams makes his infamous response. No, I haven't any anesthetic, but her screams are unimportant. I don't hear them because they are not important. The ability to work on people in pain and even to cause pain when necessary is another obstacle that bars many from the practice of medicine. A doctor who cannot rigidly compartmentalize emotional responses to the suffering of others and remain focused cannot function in certain circumstances. Sir William Osler's most famous essay, Equanimitas, describing why and how physicians must regulate their emotions is relevant here. In the long century since Osler delivered this 1889 address to students at the Pennsylvania School of Medicine, it's one of his earlier works, more than 200,000 copies of Equanimitas have been pr presented to medical students. And at Johns Hopkins, that is still the custom today for first year residents. No single piece of writing has done more to shape the demeanor of American physicians. 
It shaped Ed Hemingway and through him influenced his son. And it helps in interpreting Dr. Adams' statement that the patient's screams are unimportant. Osler writes, in the physician or surgeon, no quality takes rank with imperturbability, coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances, calmness amid storm, clearness of judgment in moments of grave peril. In other words, grace under pressure. In order to achieve that, Osler continues, the first essential is to have your nerves well in hand, even under the most serious circumstances. The physician or surgeon who shows in his face the slightest alteration expressive of anxiety or fear has not his medullary centers under the highest control and is liable to disaster at any moment. If you cannot control your expression, you won't be able to control your hands, you won't be able to control your thoughts. And so as Dr. Adams surveys the patient and considers that he may need to perform an emergency cesarean section without anesthesia, he begins to shut down his own emotional response to the screaming. Her screams are unimportant, he tells his young son, whose question alone might rattle a surgeon reaching for composure, and this is another reason maybe not to have your children with you when you're operating. But I would argue that in the father's redundant next sentence, I do not hear them because they are not important. Dr. Adams is talking to himself. He's compartmentalizing his emotions. He's literally getting his game face on. The surgeon's precious quality of imperturbability, Osler writes, is liable to be misinterpreted as hardness. And perhaps Dr. Adams' character has been subject to precisely this misinterpretation not only by critics, but by his boy Nick in Fathers and Sons, who remembers Dr. Adams as cruel. Osler, however, goes on to tell us that keen sensibility is doubtless a virtue of high order when it does not interfere with steadiness of hand or coolness of nerve, but for the practitioner in his working day world, a callousness, callousness, which thinks only of the good to be affected and goes ahead regardless of smaller considerations, like screaming, is the preferable quality. An obstetrician, for example, must go ahead regardless of screaming, his steadiness of hand and coolness of nerve unaffected. Dr. Adams, Osler might judge, only seems callous because he is imperturbable. But Osler has a warning about imperturbability, and Dr. Adams fails to heed it. Cultivate then, gentlemen, Osler writes, such a judicious measure of obtuseness as will enable you to meet the exigencies of practice with firmness and courage without, at the same time, hardening the human heart by which we live. In compartmentalizing his emotions, Dr. Adams has gone too far and does harden his heart. Not once does he speak a single word of sympathy, reassurance, or explanation to his laboring patient nor does he look at her or speak to her husband, suffering from an ax wound and smoking a pipe in the top bunk of the very same bed where his life lies screaming. There is a language barrier here. None of the Ojibwe speak to the white men either, but neither is there any attempt at communication. Dr. Adams has violated the physician's oath of Mammonides. May I never see in the patient anything but a fellow creature in pain. His failure of compassion certainly plays a role in the final shocking disaster in this story, the husband's silent suicide, slashing his throat with a straight razor, and young Nick's glimpse of the dead man weltering in his blood. The screams, it seems, were important after all. Okay, Indian camp leaves young Nick sitting in the stern of his father's boat as the sun rises, now struggling, perhaps for the first time, to compartmentalize his own emotions. As Osler advised in his 1914 book, A Way of Life, a book that Ernest kept on his shelves at the Finca and that Dr. Hemingway may have given him. Keep your life in daytight compartments, Osler wrote, and his metaphors of the watertight comp compartments in ships. Touch a button and hear at every level of your life the iron doors shutting out the past the dead yesterdays. Touch another and shut off with a metal curtain, the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you are safe, safe for today. <laughs>
The brilliant final sentence of Indian camp tells us that after all this vicarious trauma, Nick's sense of safety has not only become highly conditioned, but finally false. Listen to the conditions and the conclusion. In the early morning, on the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat, with his father rowing, he felt quite sure that he would never die. Now this sentence breaks a vital rule of style in English. Um, Suzanne, you'll appreciate this, my fellow editor. Never use more than two prepositional phrases in a row. Hemingway uses five. And I never read it without thinking of William Sapphire's statement about both the rule Hemingway breaks here and the importance of sometimes breaking rules. Never use more than two prepositional phrases in a row unless you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That immortal line from Psalm 23. Of course, the valley of the shadow of death is precisely where Nick has just been. And that valley is the physician's workplace. And it will become Ernest Hemingway's workplace as well. Now, Indian Camp opens in our time. Hemingway's portrait of the artist is a young man. And I'm going to leave him there on the brink of the horrors of World War I and the 1918 influenza pandemic, which will be another chapter in his medical education. But I, I'd like to leave you guys um, with an opportunity that's kind of dear to my heart. Sometime in the 1980s, medical schools became increasingly concerned about physician burnout and failures of compassionate care in a field that has been more and more dominated by computerized record keeping, high tech diagnostics and procedures, expensive pharmaceuticals, exploding populations of uninsured patients, and for-profit medicine that treats physicians as employees, which they are, and patients as product, which they also are. A solution arose, one solution, that Osler himself might have approved, a new emphasis on medical humanities and especially on the teaching of literature. Stories, poems, plays, essays and memoirs, a field that's sometimes called narrative medicine. Close reading, medical schools learn, enhances empathy and teaches listening skills. It emphasizes the shared humanity of patients and providers, and it helps physicians and, and nurses and other healthcare workers feel less isolated and more supported. And it's a really satisfying thing to teach because you can see it make a difference. Um, literature always makes a difference, but in this case, usually you, you will get stories about what happened. I'll just give you an example that I cherish from one of my groups. In a discussion of Margaret Edson's play, Wit, about an English professor with terminal ovarian cancer, a neurosurgeon in our group told us that he had wept over the play. The for-profit medical group he worked for had allowed him only a 15-minute follow-up appointment to tell a patient that she had an inoperable malignant brain tumor. It is a follow-up appointment, right? <laughs> Here's your test results. You're going to die. But after reading Edson's play, he told us, he felt empowered to tell the group's business manager, his supervisor, that such appointments would take as long as he felt necessary. And you can see how that improves both patient care and physician stress. So let me suggest that if you teach at a college or university that trains future or current healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, lab technicians, social workers, you might want to consider developing a literature and medicine course of your own. As for Hemingway's role in narrative medicine for the past 30 years, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is a major philanthropic organization specializing in healthcare, its, its CEO is a former director of the CDC, has placed an anthology of distinguished literature about medicine called On Doctoring into the hands of every first year medical student in the United States. This is the book, I don't know if you just take a little look. It might be a nice starting place if you are interested in this field. It's now in its third revised edition, and the book, since the beginning for 30 years, has always included two Hemingway short stories. Indian Camp, which I think you can see is a perfect storm of medical ethics. And uh, can you guess the other one that the doctors chose? It's Hills Like White Elephants 
And in fact, in this book that's now being placed in the hands of all of our doctors, Ernest Hemingway's work occupies more pages than Sir William Osler's, whose equanimitas is gone. And I just have to speak a word for nurses who don't get this book. But um, on their behalf, Teresa Brown, a Chicago uh, PhD in English who gave up teaching English to become an oncology nurse, says that she finds the essence of her profession in another Hemingway short story, this is the nurse's short story, a clean, well-lighted place. So let me just conclude by saying that Ernest Hemingway, who was educated for a medical career, has now become a medical educator. Thank you all for listening so much. Thank you so much, Susan, for that wonderful talk. We have um, so many comments and a few questions for you. So even though we're a little bit over the hour, I think we'd all like to stick around and run through a few of them. Okay. First of all, Kipling is a huge hit. The okay, cat. good. Everyone was so thrilled to see him. And as many people as were thrilled to see uh, Kipling were also fascinated by the model of the Pilar behind you. Oh, good. There she is. Yes. <laughs> and is that the model that, that we, the society gave you when you retired as editor? That right? was my lovely retirement gift from all of you and best retirement present ever. What better could you give someone whose favorite Hemingway novel is Old Man? Um, and yeah, so she has a, she has a place in the study. Okay. Up where the cat, up where the cat can't get involved. <laughs> <laughs> So um, a few of the questions, though. We had one question about what other implications uh, for Hemingway's writing do you see as a result of this medical um, education? Are there particular aspects of his writing, his worldview, um, anything that he's doing, you know, grammatically or at the sentence level that you feel are the result of this medical education? Well, I think, I think that, that that clinical point of view and that detail-oriented point of view, um, physicians of this era really looked very, 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 very closely at, at people. And I didn't have time to go into the observation piece, um, but just everybody knows Sherlock Holmes' stories, right? And I don't know whether you all realize that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a doctor and that Holmes was modeled on a professor of his who taught diagnostics. And so that whole thing that Holmes goes through when someone comes in and he looks at the calloused hands and is like, okay, this guy's a working man and he's this and he's that and the other thing. You can tell the person's whole life story just from looking at them. That is a medical point of view. And so that's something that, that Hemingway was taught to be observant, to observe those details. Um, I think that equanimitas was very important to him, whether he whether he read it or not. His father taught him that impassivity, that that immobility. I think we see it in his work in the the clinical voice, where we don't use adjectives, we don't betray emotion. Um, there's a horrible story in Southern Sudden Death, where Ed talks about being called to a woman who's in labor and is having some kind of a manic episode. And she doesn't even realize she's in labor. She's denying that she's in labor. Um, she's clearly having some kind of a psychotic wake. And he gets the baby delivered. And as soon as the baby's delivered, she calms down. And the manic episode is over. And she wants to take a nap. And he tells um, her husband that now she will be okay. And he leaves. And three hours later, she dies in a diabetic coma. There was no insulin then. Um, but when he recounts the story, he doesn't tell us how he felt about that. He just tells you what happened. And it's devastating. And Hemingway would have heard stuff like that every day. I mean, doctors, if, if you're in a doctor's family, telling stories is what they do. You know, you wait every day to find out what happened, especially if you have somebody in emergency work or obstetrics. Um, and so I, I really think the clinical point of view, the use of detail, um, the, the placing nature before anything else, this is the way things are, the way they look, um, being accurate. We're all very, very important to him. And I also think it had a bad impact on him psychologically. And I, I think if one were going to go on and do some biographical work, one could talk about compartmentalizing emotion because we know today it's vicarious trauma 
and the need to compartmentalize are huge problems for doctors, except now we realize that they have it and, uh, and they're not as reluctant to seek counseling. In fact, they're required to seek counseling if they have a case that crosses their boundaries in any way. Yeah, we have two questions about that, actually. Um, both of the questioners ask us about Hemingway's relationship to his father and his father's own depression. And they're curious if, uh, to what extent you might talk a little bit about Dr. Hemingway's own emotional health issues um, and the way that might have you know, affected his relationship with the son and his son's attitudes toward the medical field. Well, I, I think um, yeah. there's something I'm probably not, not ready to say yet, but Dr. Hemingway, okay, today, if you're a doctor practicing obstetrics, um, you have the highest rate of malpractice insurance of any medical field because it is a field in which stuff happens. There are bad outcomes. Um, maybe not quite as bad as the salmon, <laughs> but... <laughs> Young mothers of families die, infants die, infants suffer birth injuries from deprivation of oxygen. Um, even with all of the skills and things we have today, like um, blood transfusions, to practice it then, we had none of that stuff. You couldn't do, um, you couldn't do a transfusion. Um, the anesthesias that they had to really put someone out were horrible, chloroform, ether. Um, we know now that anesthesia and childbirth really don't mix that well, you know, you, because you don't want to anesthetize the baby, you need the mother's help to push, all that stuff. They didn't have any of that stuff. So a lot of Ed's patients um, would die, you know, like the woman in the diabetic coma. How devastating is that? And then you have to walk around town with everybody looking at you. You said she was going to get better. Um, when there's really nothing you could do about it. He's also practicing at a time when infectious disease is the major cause of death across all age groups. And the average life expectancy is 47, all right? So there's no, there are no vaccinations for most things. There are just a very few. And, um, so again, you're going to be watching a lot of your patients die. You don't have antibiotics of things that you cannot do anything about. Um, my dad went to medical school in World War II, and he was of that first generation to use penicillin. My father was a very crusty person. You know, he was an emergency room physician. He was an army surgeon. And when he t would tell the story of the first time he used penicillin, and a patient lived who would certainly have died, he would just break down and let cry like a baby. You know, it's one of the very few times I've ever seen him cry is telling that story. So Ed was under a tremendous amount of stress. And the other stress that you have with obstetrics is it's not quite as bad as being an emergency physician, but almost. You're in private practice, so you're on call 24 seven to your patients. And babies don't always come when they're supposed to. So there you are. You know, Mike, Mike Reynolds writes about how Ed gave up coming to the lake. Well, he, he couldn't and, and keep up an obstetric um, practice for sure. So I think Ed was under a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stress. And medicine also puts a big stress on marriages. And uh, I, I think maybe people need to cut Grace a little more slack for putting up with a, an absent father. He was very present when he was there, but he wasn't always there. Um. Um, another question has to do with Hemingway's writing. I'm sort of bouncing between the medicine and the writing a little bit because those are the two main categories right. of question. Um, but one of our other questioners asked, is there an example in Hemingway's work where he is not able to maintain clinical distance, where those lessons break down that, you know, you recall or that you find really moving? Oh my gosh. Um, pretty much every single story in our time is, is a failure to maintain clinical distance with results. I mean, okay, I'll just give you, this is a weird example. I don't know if this is really germane, but 
when I was looking at, at the letters that the Hemingway family exchanged during World War I, during the pandemic, Ernest is in the hospital. His father is absolutely in the front lines. 14,000 dead in Chicago. Oak Park is on fire. He's on his feet, you know, 48 hours a day. Um, he doesn't know if he's going to live. So he's writing a cheerful letter to his son in the hospital, who is also in the midst of the, you know, world pandemic. And he closes the letter this way. He says, goodbye, old sport. Not love dad, but goodbye, old sport. Someone who loves hunting and fishing. Read field and stream and dream of Walloon Lake. And I think that was Ed's prescription for the cares of, of the world. And, and also, okay, we, we have subscriptions, so I'm guessing he, he, he sent Ernest Field and Stream. Um, so when we look at a story like Now I Lay Me, what do we see? We see Nick struggling to put himself to sleep by thinking about fishing as his father told him to do. This is where we, we go to relax, and it's not really working. You know, just with the, the salamander and the, the crickets and the, and the things. It, it, he, he loves it and he thinks of these streams, but it also reminds him of, of painful things that remind him of other painful things. So there you have it. I mean, we, yeah. start, we start with Indian camp. We end with Big Two-Hearted River. We start by gutting a woman. We end by gutting a fish. And that's supposed to make you feel better. <laughs> and, you know, I'll just do a shout out to Pete Hayes, who made uh, is more, I think, an observation than a question. He says that Osler's uh, way of looking at the world reminds him of the Agassiz method, which, you know, of course, brings the natural world of observational study together mm -hmm. with medical um, study as well. Here's um, a question that's a little uh, different from the other ones that we're, rece that we're receiving. So in, uh, in disability studies, there's a line of thought that historically to be othered is to be associated with the animal. So, and uh, Katie Warzik, whose question this is, says so she's paraphrasing that from Leonard Davis's introdu introduction to the disability studies reader. She then goes on to ask, how might have Hemingway's early experiences with taxidermy and medicine, along with the lines of thought from the time, perhaps as you pointed out, um, that women in childbirth were disposable in the same vein as a salmon, um, affected how he engaged with uh, female, non-white, and animal figures in his literature, especially in relation to trauma and disability. So big question, lots of ideas, but also worthwhile. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very big and complex question. And I guess I would say, okay, first of all, there was a real, real, real normalization of the animal um, in medicine, animal practice in, in medicine at this time. And it's, again, I, I, one of the huge differences between then and now is imaging. Like now we have MRIs, CAT scans, PET scans, ultrasounds, echocardiograms. There isn't anything, you can see soft tissue. There wasn't any of that back then. In, in early days, even x-rays didn't come along until 1895, and they were so dangerous that, you know, during Hemingway's childhood, only about 8% of patients admitted with fractures ever had an x-ray. So what did people do? Because there are only so many human cadavers that you can study. Even Osler did a little grave robbing in his time. So by the end of the 19th century, that's still going on. You do comparative anatomy. You study comparative anatomy in medical school. You work on animals a lot. Um, my mom, in, in her medical school comparative anatomy course, they, I'm sorry, this is gross, but I just want to get it out there because it tells you what they got a call that an elephant had died at the Bronx Zoo and they were welcome to come and dissect it. And their professor took them and they dissected an elephant wearing hip waders. So yeah, right? <laughs> she remembered that for a long time. Um, so it does normalize it. But honestly, when I look at Indian camp, 
what I see is a strong statement that this is not okay. This is not okay. Um, and I, I see it again in Fathers and Sons when Nick's like, my father was, was cruel. Um, it's not okay to other the woman that way. And he, he sets up that contrast with the fish. It's shocking, you know, with in Big Two-Hearted River and the, the jackknife and the gotlators, he means to shock us by that connection. He means us to think hard about Dr. Adams. And, you know, and that is the relationship piece. Like what I mean when you see your father do something as opposed to watching somebody else do it, it, uh, you, it, it really, I don't know, it, it affects the way you think. So I, th I think that's, that's definitely a fruitful subject about animals and othering, but Hemingway had a great sympathy too with, with animals, you know, like in, oh, short, happy. And you can think like a lion who's being horribly um, killed by these <laughs> idiot trophy hunters. Um, <laughs> so yeah, run with it. But yeah, it's an important story for that. And it's why it's such a fruitful story for talking about ethics. So truth be told, there are more great questions than we'll have time to answer. So I'm going to just wrap it up with uh, two other questions. Okay. There's a lot of curiosity about, and the, and the questions are in two of them, about the end of Hemingway's life. And especially given this metal, medical education, to what degree do you think, um, you know, he was aware of his declining uh, mental uh, capacity? And then also... Uh, a question about the Mayo Clinic records and, and whether, um, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'll still put it out there, you know, whether they're uh, publicly available. Ah, okay. Well, I'd be interested to know what, what you have to say about the Mayo Clinic records. I know that Howard Rome's, we do have Howard Rome's detailed letter to Mary because she wrote to him after the death and asked him. So there's a lot of detail in there, but, but I don't know about the clinic. Um, yeah, I, at the end of his life, I do think he was very aware that he was losing it. You know, it, didn't he put a sign on the door of his room at the, at, at the Mayo saying, Ernest Hemingway, former writer? Um, I, he didn't know the precise causes of what was happening, but neither did his doctors. Mm -hmm. You know, he was being presented with some very crude solutions that were not right for, for his injured brain or for his alcoholism. And um, I, I really am a great fan of Andrew Farris, Hemingway's brain. Um, so yeah. And the, um, so there are two questions also related. One is, can we chat out the titles of the books you mentioned? And the answer is no, because I don't have them all, but I think we can send an email to all of the attendees that we'll have we can ask Susan to make us a list of the works you referenced. Okay. Yeah. There, weren't, there weren't that many of them. I think there were only three, so we can do that. Okay. And um, somebody else is asking about other recommendations for a literature and medicine syllabus. So maybe we can get that kind of information out to attendees. I'm just going to, look, this will take care of all your needs. <laughs> get this anthology. It's, it's just packed with stuff. Um, you know, fabulous writers like Auden, William Carlos Williams, Walt Whitman, but also a lot of people who are very important um, in, in the medical field now, you know, physician writers, etc. And there's so much in here that this is absolutely the starting point. You go through here, you will get all kinds of ideas and you will get suggestions. You know, one super writer that I love a lot is uh, Abraham Verghese and his book in, in an my own country and there's a little excerpt in there but you look at that you like it it's like i gotta read my own country and you do so just get this it's like one-stop shopping for your <laughs> syllabus <laughs> right well thank you so much susan for your presentation today um so many people um are saying excellent amazing just incredibly engaging wild applause we have so many positive, exciting comments. I wish I could share them all with you. Uh, so thank you. And thank you to Carl for your introduction to the webinar series. And at this point, I would like to remind everyone that this is just the first of three webinar series events uh, that are academic sessions. And we also have 
a business meeting. So we hope you'll join us again tomorrow. It's a 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for a session on the Hemingway Letters Project featuring General Editor Sandra Spanier, Miriam B. Mandel, who's been an editor on Volumes 4 and 5, and Katie Warzuk, who is the Hemingway Letters Project Graduate Assistants, moderated all by Associate Editor Verna Kale. And then we hope you'll join us on Sunday, July 19th at 4 p.m. for a discussion of the long-awaited Hemingway, a film by Ken Burns and Lynn Novak. And those of you who are longstanding members will remember the, the genesis of their project when they came to speak to us in 2016 at Oak Park. Well, the film has a rough cut. We're going to get to preview about 10 minutes of it. And Alex Vernon, who is a board member of the Hemingway Society, will host a discussion with producer Lynn Novick and associate producer Sarah Botstein. Members of the Society can also join us for the membership meeting after the documentary uh, discussion on Sunday, July 19th at 5.30 p.m. So if you are not a member and want to join us for our meeting, please visit www.hemingwaysociety.org and become a member today. So anyway, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Carl. Thanks to all our audience members. I'm sorry to those of you who experienced some sound issues. We'll try to understand. There were a few, just two or three. So we'll try to understand what's happening there. Um, and improve it for next session. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye, everyone. See you on uh, tomorrow at 1 Eastern Daylight Time.